It's Transfiguration Sunday, which most of us wonder what that means. <laughs> uh, the word isn't very common to begin with, transfiguration. And the event it describes is a little bit tough to understand. The event happened on a mountain. If it wasn't the first mountaintop experience ever, it was certainly one that uh, one of the most important. And so that's celebrated today. It, it's recorded in all of the Gospels, or referred to at least in the Gospel of John. And it clearly had an impact on the people who were part of it. They remembered it many years later. But what does it have to do with us? What kind of response is expected of us on this particular day? You notice the colors are changed to white. It's a celebratory day as we experience, as we talk about what transfiguration is. And so we're going to explore that a little bit today in our worship service. Those of you who are online, those of you who are present with us in the room, I want to welcome you to this February 27th service of Osceola United Methodist Church here in Osceola, Wisconsin. And it's wonderful to have you with us today. I invite those in the room, if you would stand up, and those of you who are at home, let us join together responsively in our call to worship. We come together today in awe and wonder before the God we worship. And the struggle of our individual life. But in the midst of the worries and the struggles is God, our radiant source of love and hope. We worship together today in awe and wonder to worship the God who transforms our lives. I invite you to join me in singing When Morning Gilds the Skies as James and Maritza lead us off. <laughs> Join in singing. When morning kills the skies, my heart awakening cries. May Jesus Christ be praised. While like at work and prayer, to Jesus I repair. May Jesus Christ. The night becomes as day when from the heart we say, may Jesus Christ be praised. The powers of darkness fear when this sweet chant they hear, may Jesus Christ. Let all the earth around bring joyous with the sound. May Jesus Christ be praised in heaven's eternal bliss. The loveliest strain is this. May Jesus Christ. Be this while life is mine, my canticle divine. May Jesus Christ be praised. May this the eternal song through all the ages long. May Amen. 
Amen. Please be seated. May Jesus Christ be praised. Let that be our song, our repeated refrain throughout this morning, throughout this um, this coming week in all of our lives as, as we live today. So that's what today is about, the praise of our Lord Jesus. I want to step into the passage where we, um, where we encounter this event, the transfiguration. And so I invite you to join me with this prayer for illumination as we look into this passage, that God may bless our minds, our understanding, and our hearts uh, with, um, with God's message for us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. As I mentioned, this event is recorded in in more detail in in three of the Gospels, and then it's referred to in the Gospel of John. I'm looking at the passage that is actually our lectionary passage for today from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Um, I'm sorry, Luke 9, verses 28 through 36. Yes, and, uh, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible is the translation that we're using. About eight days after Jesus said these things, I'll look in a minute to what these things are that Jesus said. After eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and they spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those who were with him were almost overcome with sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. And while Peter was still speaking, a cloud overshadowed them. And when they entered the crowd, they were o- cloud, they were overcome with awe. And then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless. And at the time, he told, no one, he told them to tell no one what they had seen. May, Jesus, may God bless the hearing and the understanding of this portion of scripture. Thanks be to God. An exciting, interesting event that we find um, reflected, uh, recorded in the scriptures. There, There are moments in all of our lives when we look back, that we look back on with some wonder and awe. Maybe it's an event like at a, at a concert where we particularly moved or, or maybe it's as we stand and look up at a, at a mountain or um, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that, that Cheryl and I had a chance to be on the shores of Lake Superior and sometimes there are moments looking at the lake where there are these moments of awe. And sometimes it's because of where we are. Sometimes... These moments come because of who we're with. It it may have had something to do with what we experienced or what we had a chance to observe when we have these moments. At any rate, all of us have had some of these moments in our lives that have had real impact. We experience an emotional high, and we might even um, view this experience as life-changing. At some moments, it's like we're experiencing complete unity within us and around us. We might even feel as if we're having a momentary glimpse of heaven. It may happen when we stand on a mountaintop. Some of you have had a chance to do that, be on a mountaintop and look around at the vista. And 
that's kind of what gave the title to it, the name to it. It's called, we call it a mountaintop experience. Those mountains that are so particularly special. I've had a couple of them myself. One of them uh, that I still remember actually happened on a real mountain. I was in high school. Uh, I was at a camp out in Colorado with a group from my school, and there were kids from schools all over the country. We didn't get very far into the week before there was some serious racial tension that developed between groups, and it became apparent so that it affected all of us. And it got so bad that finally one night the camp director called us to task. It, there was an evening club. The whole camp was all gathered together, and he read us the riot act and, and invited us to go to quiet time and sit and reflect about who the people were that we seemed to be so antagonistic about. The next day at this camp, it was scheduled to have an all-camp mountain climb. And, and it would take most of the day that we'd hike up to the type of the mountain that this camp was at the base of, and we'd have lunch up there and then make our way down. After the meeting the night before, the, the, the atmosphere was a little bit muted, was a little bit quieter than it had to be. And, well, it, it was a tough climb. There were some really challenging parts to it. And, and while the staff did everything they possibly could to keep us safe, a girl fell. It was about 40 feet down a steep hill and a drop. And her skid stopped just about a foot from a more dangerous precipice that dropped just way down to the valley. There were a couple of the leaders and a couple of the more athletic students that made their way down to where she was and were able to, to direct her to get her to safety because where she was was particularly dangerous and now clouds were coming over and there was a, a rainstorm threatening up here on the mountain. She had broken a couple of ribs and she had multiple severe stain sprains and so she was unable really to accomplish anything herself. She needed to be kept safe and so some of the group made their way down the mountain to get help. Some of the others tried to protect her as the rainstorm came up over us and it rained on us. When the rescue crew got back with the field stretcher, it took the whole group working together to get her down the mountain to an ambulance where she could get care. And some of those carrying the stretchers were people who'd been on the opposite sides of the racial conflict the day before. The whole atmosphere of the camp changed. Because of that event, we realized how we needed one another. And people who had thought themselves so different from one another, unable to trust one another, had found that on the mountainside, they really had had to trust one another. And all of us have remembered that event since then as life-changing. I haven't seen Sue in quite a while. She was one of my schoolmates, one of my classmates, the one who fell. Though we're still Facebook friends. I should, I'll, I'll post her and tell her that I talked about her today. <laughs> um, but... The thing was an emotional high. We remember it. it. It changed the way we thought. It really was a mountaintop experience. That's kind of what camps, church camp is meant to be, one of those mountaintop experiences, isn't it? The only thing is you have to go back home. This phrase, a mountaintop experience, actually comes from this event, or perhaps there's an earlier mountaintop experience that was when Moses went up on top of the mountain and actually met God. God gave him the Ten Commandments then on the top of Mount Sinai. That, that was kind of a mountaintop experience. And here, these three disciples, closest friends of Jesus, are experiencing Jesus in a way that they'd never seen him before. They'd, they'd been with him for over two years at this point, and they'd seen some pretty miraculous things happen around there, miracles and wonders. They'd known all of that. They'd seen those miracles before, but this is the first time they'd seen Jesus 
really changed. Jesus himself had changed before their eyes. And, and this mountaintop experience, this prototype, as I said, it's important enough to be recorded in at least three of the Gospels and talked to about other ones. In fact, John and the Apostle Paul refer to it in their letters later on in the New Testament. And, and so what is it that makes this event so important to play? So let's look at what it is. Well, who is it there? It's Jesus who heads up the mountain, and it's James and Peter and John, really the three of the 12, the disciples who were closest to him, the ones who were kind of the leaders of the group, and he takes them up. Sometimes, you know, Jesus often went apart to pray, and this seemed to be the point that he was going up on the mountain to get some solitude to pray, but he's also, uh, he's also a teacher who takes apprentice, apprentices, and so he brought these followers with him up the mountaintop so that they could be part of it. Where did it happen? It doesn't say for certain in the text, but most scholars now believe that it might have been at the top of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is a 9,200-foot mountain north of most of Israel, north of the region of Galilee. It's not too far from the city of Caesarea Philippi which just the passage before says that Jesus had taken the disciples to. And when did it happen in the experience? Well, at Caesarea Philippi, there was a, an event that was fairly important. Jesus asked his disciples, he quizzed them, he said, so who are people saying that I am? And, and the disciples responded to Jesus saying, well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're John the Baptist who's come back from the dead. Or, or some are, are saying you're one of the other prophets. And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, this is something not you've not figured out on your own. This is revealed to you by God. That An important moment there. And Caesarea Philippi is up even further north. This mountain, Mount Hermon, is fairly close to there. So it's thought perhaps heading back towards, towards Israel, towards the main part of Israel, this is where this event on Mount Hermon happened. And this is when it happened. So Jesus had actually told them after Peter said that, he said a few difficult things to them. Peter had said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, yep, don't tell anybody about it. And I tell you that the son of man is going to suffer many things at the hands of evil men and will suffer and die and in three days will be raised again. And it tells us even in the text after that that the disciples had no idea, couldn't understand what he was talking about. And they were saying, what, what, what's he saying? What does that mean that he's going to die and rise again? And he's talking about it like it's, it's coming soon, that it's not way off in the distant future. And, and it was, they're still processing all of that when they come to this moment and Jesus goes up the mountain to pray and a couple of the disciples are really glad to keep, keep their eyes on him. They want to they want to make sure he doesn't get out of their sight because they're still trying to figure out what's going on with him. And so they go up the mountain with him. They understand that there's something changing in, D in Jesus' ministry now. It had started out with this dire warning, this, this prediction. It started out talking about the path to Jerusalem, which is so much darker now. And that may be exactly why it happens. There seems to be a corner turned in all of Jesus' ministry toward what's going to happen to him and what's going to happen in Jerusalem. So, so what does it say? Why does Jesus go up the mountain? Well, he often went away from people to pray. He knows what's coming. And the, no, the normal reaction when you know something is coming like this is the adrenaline starts working and what, what kicks in is what we call the fight or flight syndrome where you want to run away, but Jesus knows that he can't do either. He can't fight this and he can't run. He needs the strength to face a coming trial. And so he calls on heaven for that strength. He prays for strength not to get up the mountain, but to head back down the mountain into the suffering that he faces. 
He prays for the hope to lead him through the dark days ahead. And he gets his answer. I don't know if Jesus was expecting this to happen himself when he went up the mountain, but he's talking to God, and and it's like God gave this blessing where suddenly Jesus himself is changed. And suddenly there is a, there are a couple of the great heroes of the faith standing next to him and they're glowing too. And so Jesus needed that moment. The disciples, well, they're awakened by this intense brilliance thinking, what's going on here? Is this a vision or are we having a hallucination? You know, the air is a little bit thinner up here. Maybe that's what's going on. But the light grows more intense, and and they feel it. They don't just see it. It's like until now, they'd seen Jesus' miracles, but until now, the tent of Jesus' humanity had covered who he really was. But now a flap on that tent is raised, and these three are given a glimpse of God's glory. You know, Jesus is God incarnate, but so often... They're experiencing a human with great power, yeah, but just a human being who ate with them and who slept with them and who, you know, walked around the countryside with them. But now there's something that they see how amazing the power of God is in this person. And then they see Elijah and Moses standing there, and it says they were having conversation. In fact, in the text, it says they were having conversation about Jerusalem. They were talking to Jesus about what he had said was going to happen, the suffering he would face, about what was going to happen in Jerusalem. And I think they were there as emissaries of God just to remind Jesus who he was. You've got this. You've got the power of God with you and in you and behind you through all of this. Jesus must have longed to step off the mountain with those two and head right back to glory, but he knew that his path was going to lead down the mountain into all of that trouble. And so he did. It's interesting that as he's standing there being encouraged and strengthened by them, Peter interrupts. And why? Because that's what Peter does. He had a particular gift for sticking his foot in his mouth. And once again, he does that. And once again, he's asked to step aside. Only this time, when he is asked to step aside, it's God's voice. This is my son, my chosen one. In, in the different account, this is from the Gospel of Luke and Mark's account. It adds the words, this is my son whom I dearly love in whom I'm well pleased. Author Ken Geyer says in Moments with the Savior that that the mountaintop quakes with an aftershock from those words. The disciples tumble to the ground, but the words have a different effect on Jesus, a settling effect. They were what he needed to hear three years ago when he had temptations in the wilderness. They were what he needs to hear now before he faces the tortures of the cross. He needs to hear the words, but maybe even more than the words themselves, he needs to hear the voice, that familiar inflection, that fatherly tone, so rich in resonance, so full of eternity. Just the sound of the Father's voice infuses him with strength. The voice returns, rending the veil of the mountain air like a stab of lightning. Listen to him. So Jesus then touches the disciples and they get up. Uh, Elijah and Moses, they're gone. It's just Jesus with them now. But that's all they need. You see, the transfiguration is for Jesus. He needed that strength. He needed that moment, that experience, that encouragement. But it's also for the disciples. They needed to hear the voice of God because they would be facing their own suffering. They would be facing the loss of Jesus very soon. And they would be facing a life in which they needed to step out, often feeling like they were on their own. The message Jesus had been trying to get through to them is crucial. He's going to suffer and die, and they have to brace themselves for it. God tells them to listen up. 
Jesus had told them that before, and he'd repeat it many times, of course. But, well, this time, maybe with this event, event they'll remember it. Uh, they'll understand. They'll remember. Uh, Peter will remember 30 years later when he's writing his letters near the end of his life when he's writing to Christians who are suffering themselves. He says, we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. And John will remember it even 60 or 70 years later when he writes, we have seen his glory. Before that day, the disciples had seen the excitement and the glory, but they didn't realize that the road to glory was going to lead through a valley of death, through a tunnel of suffering. Jesus asked his disciples to follow him through that tunnel. They would have to leave everything behind. And so maybe the transfiguration, that's a big sort of fancy theological word that nobody ever really uses in real life. But it's a change. It's a glimpse of glory. Maybe that transfiguration, maybe that's the light at the end of the tunnel. The glory, a glimpse of the glory on the other side. And the way to glory is not the road around suffering, but it's right through it. So the transfiguration happened for Jesus. It happened for the disciples, but it also happens for us because we're there like the disciples. We've had great experiences and we've remembered these mountaintop experiences. But are those just random or have we ever thought perhaps this experience is meant to have more meaning in our life than we give it? Maybe God is wanting to use it for our future. I love it when I am impacted, where I'm just moved by, by some event that reminds me, somehow opens a tent flap to glory, maybe cracks open the window, the shutters to, to heaven, and I get a glimpse of that, and I just feel overwhelmed and feel, filled with, with God's presence, it's a mountaintop experience. Does God want to use that in my life? Does God want to use that in your lives when we have those types of moments? Are those supposed to be moments of inspiration to drive us forward? Forward through what? And that, that demands then that we stay in touch with God, that we say, what, God, where are you leading me through this? The event opened the disciples' eyes to so many things. Maybe that has to do with the change itself. Maybe this odd little moment on top of a mountain is all about embracing changes that we're facing and being called to change ourselves. You know, the Apostle Paul writes, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Become more like Jesus. That's what it that's what it seemed that the voice was saying. This is, this is my son in whom I greatly pleased. The chosen one, you should listen to him. Peter, he was, you know, he was kind of against doing the change. He said, you know what? Let's just stay here. Let's set up camp. Let's not head back down the mountain. This is a good thing. Except Jesus knew that the way forward was down the mountain. That the way through the mission was down the mountain. So why do we experience mountaintop experiences? Why do, maybe it's to invite us to worship. Maybe it's to get a glimpse of God in our lives. Maybe it's to give us each the sight and sound and feel and smell and taste of God that will sustain us in times when God seems absent. Maybe the mountaintop experience is to remind us that the presence of God is something real. It's tangible at that moment, even when God seems to be gone. We'd love to stay on the mountaintop. We'd love to stay there reveling in the glory. But Jesus calls us down the mountain back into the mission that he has given to us. So on our way to glory, we too may share some of the same suffering 
that the disciples did that they would come to know. We are definitely led back down the mountain to service. So when we look back at such mountaintop experiences that we might have had in our own lives, why don't we let them be an aid to help us discover that they are pointing forward to the hope. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for moments in our lives when we're overwhelmed by something. And we recognize that perhaps it's your presence. Thank you for those mountaintop experiences and we pray that they will not just be something that, that we move past and forget, but that, that we will embrace them and internalize them and embody them so that they will lead us forward into your mission. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to take some time together to pray um, because our world definitely needs prayer. Um, we can't escape the news about the invasion of Ukraine and about the people there who are suffering, the refugees there. It reminds us that there is great suffering around the world, that there is that there are, are places where people... Um, that we don't hear of so often where people are being forced out of their homes because of active violence. And, uh, and so we pray for those folks in the Ukraine. Um, I appreciate that we are invited to pray not just for ourselves, but for the world. God invites us, all of us, tiny little churches like ours to, to come and, and lift up people on the other side of the world 
And so we get to do that. We get to partner. We're partnered with God in our prayers. But we also get to lift up our prayers for our loved ones and our neighbors. And so we just heard last night that, that Mikey, has had a, Mikey had a procedure this week and probably pushed it too much coming out of it, had some stints in his leg, and he's back towards Rochester. So prayers for Mikey and Liz. Um, you've heard, and, and a lot of people have responded, that how Cheryl fell down. She fell down a flight of stairs and had a slight concussion with that. And she's recovering from that. Um, and and we celebrated her birthday. And I don't know if she celebrated too much. No, she's, she's doing fine, but she's not with me this morning. But we appreciate the prayers for Cheryl and, and give thanks for that. Isn't it something, though, that we have this... We have this ability to talk to God about those that we love who are suffering, um, who may need a little bit of a boost. And we're invited to pray about big things that are really scaring us and about not so big things, little, even the inconveniences. God, God invites us to come anytime, any place with those. And, and so... It's sort of special to be able to join together in a fellowship as we have here and uh, in the room and those who are not able to be in the room because you're online, but you're still joining us online. We don't have to be physically in one another's space to be able to lift up in prayer. And so we're going to do that today. And, and I'm not going to take time just to invite prayer requests. We've got some of them there in the bulletin. There is a list of some of those that we heard earlier in the week, but of course things change so quickly that that there are always new prayer requests. Uh, our list of prayers that are near the back of the um, of our bulletin, um, I know page nine if you can find page nine in it, are have lists of some of the people in our fellowship who 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 need healing. Uh, some of the people, there are names on there that you're not going to know everybody, but there are folks that someone in our fellowship knows who might have a broken heart, who might have challenges that are facing them, and we get to pray for them. And so I invite you to join me in this time of prayer for our world and for our loved ones. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for prayer. Thank you for the fellowship that we have here, here in the room, here online. Thank you that we can come and talk to you and that you unite us, whether we're in the same place or on opposite sides of the globe. We also realize that on other sides of the globe, there are, there are fellow believers, and some of them are suffering greatly right now. And so we lift up to you all of those who are suffering. We thank you, Lord, that you answer prayer and that you bless us in so many ways. But we lift up to you all those who grieve. We're going to just take a moment and think about those that we know in our lives and those who we must imagine somewhere in the globe that are grieving the loss of loved ones right now. For those who grieve, Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who are needing healing, whether it's physical healing or, or emotional or mental healing. We pray that you, dear God of the dear healer, that you will touch their lives. For all those needing healing, Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who suffer, and there is so much suffering. There's always a lot of suffering, and there are sometimes things that just shake up our lives and remind us of it. And so, Lord, we pray for those who around the world and in our lives are suffering as we think on them right now.
for all who suffer, Lord, in your love. Hear this, our prayer. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray for leaders in our own community and decisions that are made here locally, but but we pray for our leaders around the globe, some who, who shock us with the decisions that they make and some who, who we just pray and hope will be compassionate and wise and, and strong. Lord, we pray that your spirit will infect the leaders of our nations, the leaders of our globe. We pray that hearts will be softened and opened and that our leaders will, will respond to you. So we lift up, Lord, individually. We think of leaders that we want to lift up. For our leaders, Lord, in your love, hear this, our prayer. We pray, Lord, for all of those who serve, and, and we think of those who are serving in the military and those who are serving in the police force and the fire department and in the EMTs and those who are serving in our schools and serving in our city and municipal and state. Uh, there are so many who serve their neighbors, and we thank you for that, Lord. Let the servants be the ones who have an impact on our world, those who give of themselves for one another. We pray especially even as, as we are receiving happier and hopeful news about the pandemic, we pray for those who serve in our medical community. Bless them and restore them and strengthen them, Lord. Lord, for all who serve, Lord, in your love, hear this, our prayer. And Lord, we pray for your church. We pray for our church. We pray for the church that around the globe continues to speak your truth. We pray for the churches in Russia and the churches in Ukraine. We pray for everywhere that your people are, that they will continue to speak your truth, your hope, your grace and love without fear. And we pray that their words will have an impact. Lord, use us as your church here in this community to make a difference in the lives of people, people who you love. So Lord, we lift up your church. Lord, in your love, hear this, our prayer. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you know us and you know our needs before we even utter them. Thank you that you meet us more than halfway. And we pray that we will respond as your disciples, as your servants, as your followers. We pray all this in Jesus' name as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing Shine Jesus Shine in our, uh, and the words will be up on the screen. James and Maritza are going to lead us off with the chorus and then we'll join in on the first verse singing Shine Jesus Shine. Use the words that are up on the screen. <laughs>
is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on The words are a, are a prayer that God will live and work through us. Uh, we thank everybody who's been so supportive of the ministry of our church here. Um, and supportive in all kinds of ways with prayer, um, with finances. And so we want to give thanks for those gifts and those resources that people have um have blessed us with and so I invite you to join me in a prayer of dedication for the gifts that we have received in support of the ministry here let's dedicate our gifts to God will you join me um, in the prayer that is up on the screen or on your screens at home transforming God we come to your altar this morning knowing that in our giving and in our living we have an often put just enough into living our faith so as not to impact our lifestyles or to cause too much discomfort. We have been reluctant to let go of our affinity for the things of this world. And in our attachments, we have often missed the opportunity for the transformed lives you desire for us. 
May our offering this morning be an invitation to living a life radically transformed by your power, love, and grace. We pray this in the mighty love of Jesus. Amen. Our prayer of dedication is also a prayer of confession that so often we are, um, we are neglectful, that we are distracted, drawn away from other things. And so we have an opportunity to focus a little bit more on that. That's part of what Lent is about, and we are entering the season of Lent. Um, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we will be holding a service here in um, and the fellowship hall, uh, uh, a service for Ash Wednesday, in which we'll have the imposition of ashes and and celebrate that. We invite you to come with that. We're still maintaining um, uh, a, co a COVID consciousness as we deal with that, but. We're really hopeful as we hear numbers coming down and changes of reports. And so in the next couple of weeks, uh, be, please pay attention. We'll be finding that maybe some of the restrictions that we have uh, been so careful with, we're able to dial them back a little bit. So that's something hopeful coming up in the, in the next few weeks. But this week... Join us for our Lenten evening service. Uh, a couple of other things that are going on. Every Wednesday in, during the season of Lent, there will be posted online a new meditation that comes from some of the leaders in our circuit. So I'll be part of it, and Pastor Ramstead in, in, um, in Hudson and... Um, uh, Pastor Diener in New Richmond and others who are all contributing. So every Wednesday we'll be able to join with a devotion there. And then there's also something that I invite you to take on um, for the day. Those of you who are in the worship service today, I invite you to pick up a packet. And if if you are unable to join us next uh, this Wednesday, um, you can do your own Lenten devotion with um, sackcloth and ashes as we gave out last week. Uh, there is also communion if you're unable to join us for our service of communion next week, our first Sunday of Lent. And then we invite you to follow. Um, there's a giving from abundance calendar that is in your um, that will be included. That's included in the packet uh, that invites you to give for our mission project for this coming mission project. And uh, there is a set of cards Instead of a booklet to go through, you get flashcards <laughs> for Lent. And each one will be, um, will be what you can do each day. So starting with Ash Wednesday. And the focus of our flashcards is the garden. We're inviting you to come to the garden. It's still a little bit early. Cheryl and I discovered as we went looking for seeds to include, um, <laughs> they don't have them in most of the stores yet. And so we're... Um, we're wanting, but we want you to start thinking about gardens and what God has done with the garden to you, how God has used the garden to draw us closer. And so we'll be looking at that each each day. There's a devotion or an activity that is focused on flowers and things that are growing. And then on Wednesday nights, that will be the, the focus of our reflection every Wednesday as we gather for our Lenten services. We start Ash Wednesday, but every Wednesday evening at 7 during Lent, we'll be having, um, having a worship service slash study as we reflect on, on the cards that we have here. So um, Mark has handed out a couple already. As you leave, make sure you pick up one of the packets that you can take. And if you not happen, if you don't happen to be in the church, we're going to get some out to you, so um, so that we uh, everybody will have a chance to have some of these packets as as we enter into our season of Lent. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about. And the giving from abundance calendar is, is part of it, is that in Lent, we start a new Lenten mission. And we have looked at a couple of things. We normally try to do a couple of things, uh, a local mission and a more global mission as we approach that. Um, we will be using our Lenten calendar of abundance 
and uh, we will be collecting to support one of the missions. And in the past week, we have, um, this has been kind of an audible call, is that we have found that it is, um, that there are some specific needs in the region of the Ukraine. The United Methodist Church has, um, has now a couple of, of, well, the United Methodist Committee on Relief has an international disaster response and recovery number. So there's an advance for that. And our church is connecting with that. So we will be helping to support that. And then there's another advance number in which we are supporting pastors in Moldova, Moldova and Ukraine. And so some of those are, are going on. So that's part of especially that his raised up. So that's that may be part of our mission. Um, related to all that, um, Pope Francis has just issued a, a call, well, just this weekend, asking for us to use Wednesday, um, this coming Wednesday, which is Ash Wednesday, March 2nd, as a day of fasting and prayer for for um, for peace, particularly in the region where there is we're so aware of the violence right now. And so that's um, that I invite us to to participate however that we might on Wednesday. And so those are um, I think those are really the, the important things to call on. I invite you to join us Wednesday and and uh, and be in prayer as we enter this season of Lent. And so um, I invite you, stand up. Let's stand uh, for the benediction. I invite you to, uh, to say it with me. It's up on the screen or on your screens at home. God of transformation, we confess that we are reluctant to change even when it might be for our best. Help us to trust and rest in knowing that whatever change happens, your love will remain constant. Empower us to trust that your grace is leading us towards sanctification and even glorification. Amen. Let's sing Let There Be Peace on Earth in response. <laughs> Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be with God our be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. And in the name of the resurrected Christ, all God's people said, Amen. God bless you this week, folks. Hope to see you Wednesday for our Ash Wednesday service.